from a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to quickly identify and share with loved ones monkeypox. And now, the podcast host who selfishly keeps his monkeypox all to himself, Pete Dominic. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. Thank you, Pete Coe, for another amazing introduction. Don't forget, this shed is solar powered. Yes, that's right, folks. And the air conditioner works as well. I'm in a good place. You can be happy about that. Awesome guests joining me on today's show. I've got two of your favorites. It's Dr. Aaron Carroll first, then Dr. Jason Johnson. There are certainly different kinds of doctors, but they're great on the show. Super smart. Love having them. You're going to love my conversations with both of them on today's show. Thank you to everybody who hung out with me last night. We did the Thursday night hangout on Wednesday night because I today am on my way up to Pennsylvania. It's north of me where I am here in New York. And I'll be meeting up with 19 of my friends for Stang Bang, Kara. My friend Kara O'Connor out in Chicago said, I hope you have a great time at Stag Bag. No, it's Stang Bang, Mustangs. And we're we're all going to bang each other most likely. Yeah, I don't need your judgment. Stang Bang this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Very excited to see a whole bunch of my old high school friends. Can't believe we're doing it again. And hope that you do similar things like that. And if you don't, you can always live vicariously through me. Or if it sounds like a goddamn nightmare, I respect that as well. (laughs) Whatever floats your boat. I'm happy to have you listening. Happy to have you being part of a community. And really great to see so many of you last night at last night's hangout. We had a lot of laughs. Matter of fact, at one point, Kimberly Richardson, who was on the show yesterday, joining us she was painting her new house a room in her new house in like one of those uh those painting suits it looked like she was making maybe meth too somebody mentioned anyway we watched her paint during the hangout and did color commentary and we were dying it was so funny so many hilarious thoughtful people and we had a great time and a great chat last night so i'm gonna get to my guests before i do a couple of news stories i was gonna joke and say this is your one-stop place for all of your news on the johnny depp amber heard trial And then, of course, not talk about it at all because it's just sensational celebrity gossip. But in fact, there are some important consequences of it. And I and I realized that, I guess, at the end, I wasn't paying attention to it. Apparently, it was huge, especially on TikTok. My daughter's or my younger daughter certainly was aware of it and and watching some of it. But Wajahad Ali uh, tweeted after it was over, regardless of your thoughts on the Depp Heard trial, men's rights activists who are often toxic extremists, by the way, love today's ruling. Ali Mistal tweeted that even assuming that a net $13 million down is somehow ruling for both, the problem I'm highlighting is about how future abusers will respond to this ruling. Most victims aren't going to roll the dice on this kind of thing. And then listen to the Republican Party, including Republican women who really seem to hate women. Here's Dana Loesch. That's uh, Jeff Jarvis said that uh, and then and then shared these two tweets. Dana Loesch is a gun rights activist woman, right-wing media person. She tweeted, Amber Heard just destroyed, quote, believe all women, which is such a weird thing. Okay, moving on. Ann Coulter then tweeted, and thus ends the hashtag MeToo movement. So lots of reactions that I guess do matter. Here is one soundbite to share with you. This from MSNBC broadcast yesterday where... Lawyer and legal analyst Caroline Polisi uh, told MSNBC's Kirsten Welker, well, answered this question. Will this set back the broader uh, Me Too movement and and women who do want to speak out against abuse? Oh, absolutely, Kirsten. When you look at this in the broader cultural context, look, each trial is supposed to be sort of, you know, uh, not not knowing about the larger cultural context that it sits in. But without a doubt, this will have a massive chilling effect on the Me Too movement, on women speaking out. It it is, you know, regardless of who you believe in this case, Amber Heard's statement there is undeniably true. Um, You know, Johnny Depp had more resources to pour into his defense. And she points out quite, quite well there, I would note that, you know, uh, He did have an uphill battle. All that she really had to prove in this case was that one instance of potential physical violence occurred throughout 
the, the duration of her um, relationship with Johnny Depp. And, and so what his lawyers were able to prove by, as I noted, eviscerating her credibility on other issues, I would note, um, you know, they were able to convince the jurors that she was lying with respect to every single allegation. And so, you know, absolutely, without a doubt, this will have farther reaching, reaching repercussions on sort of the, the cultural moment that, that we find ourselves in today. All right. Well, I'll be talking with guests, experts on that issue and uh, all the other issues regarding women's equity and progress and liberation and feminism in the weeks to come. I I guess I didn't quite see that. I I just really didn't pay attention to it because it was such seemingly a sensationalized celebrity gossip, social media thing. And I'm not a fan of Johnny Depp. Like, I don't know that much about him he's one of the greatest actors i guess ever he's a super weird guy for all kinds of weird things i just wasn't going to pay attention to that if you did then so be it not judging you but the outcome of it i mean i might be judging you a little bit like i guess it was entertaining i watched some clips i'm not gonna lie okay well the outcome of it matters apparently and i and i realize that now day 498 of the biden presidency and just want to mention that it is also Pride Month. June is Pride Month. And anywhere you see anti-gay bigotry, you got to do something about it. You got to stand up for folks, stand by folks. And the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And increasingly, we are having issues again. I mean, we're, we're taking steps backwards. So I think that's really important to, to, to mention that 71 percent of Americans support same sex marriage. Seventy one percent. Such a big deal, such an important number. We overwhelmingly support uh, equity when it comes to sexual orientation in this country. And when the, the, by the way, the the, it was first polled, this issue, same-sex marriage in 1996, only 27% of Americans supported legalizing gay marriage. And it wasn't until 2011 that support reached the majority level. I think I was part of that 27% in 1996. And I think that has a lot to do with my mom's brother, my uncle Jim. Uh, who's gay and I just the idea of him not being able to marry somebody just I couldn't fathom that so I think a lot of people felt that way even that that point okay so pride month and finally just want to mention of course uh, another horrible shooting this one in Tulsa Oklahoma at a hospital not going to go into the details you probably already know more than I do about it this is part of me not doing uh, the news like that but I did see this statistic and want to mention it and just say this 20 mass shootings since Uvalde in Texas last week, apparently. 20 mass shootings, depending on how you classify them. But it's, there's an epidemic of gun violence in our country. It continues. But we have to live here, and so we can't give up. Join your local chapter of Moms Demand. Support organizations like the the Brady uh, Buzz organization, as well as Gun Sense. Get involved and make changes. We, we can do it. But just being miserable and complaining, sad, terrified and depressed about it won't do it. So that is my positive message for today here at the top. I thank you so much for all the email correspondence still coming in and all of the new subscribers as well. It's been great. I know I haven't read the names of subscribers. I keep meaning to do that. And I'm writing it down on my my to do list now because I definitely want to give those shout outs if it matters at all. So happy to see those new subscriptions come in. And as even after I killed the new segment, which so many people have been giving me great feedback in, it keeps coming. Thank you very much for that. All right. That's it for the opening. There you go. Ronnie Gonzalez. He says, you gotta, you gotta do an opening. You gotta do some kind of a monologue. Well, that's, that's what I got for you guys today. I hope you liked it. And now it's time to get to my interviews, which I know you're going to love. Dr. Jason Johnson and I sat down on Tuesday. We had a great conversation. That's coming up. But first, Dr. Aaron Carroll and I sat down yesterday. And of course, Dr. Carroll is the chief health officer at Indiana University now. Someday he'll be the president of that or some other university, is my guess. He is, of course, a pediatrician. He is one of the country's most respected medical researchers. He researches all the research for you, so you don't have to. We talked a little bit about that. He's got a brand new New York Times article out, which uh, we talked about, I mentioned. It's titled, Stay Home While Sick? Is This the Economy? Calling in sick is more fraught than ever. That's in the New York Times this week, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Subscribe to his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash healthcare triage. Follow him on Twitter, of course, at Aaron E. Carroll. It's time for Dr. Carroll. 
And a great intro jingle, intro song by the great Gareth Sever of Buckets and Boards. Oh, and it's a collaboration with a little voiceover from Pete Co. Aging Dr. Carol. Aging, aging Dr. Carol. Aaron Carol. He's Karen, and he shares it all. Aaron Carol. He's blaring it out and bears it all. He knows modern medicine dispels disinformation. He's a brilliant pediatrician. Call that and then song. Aaron NYTO and puts out HC training. Dr. Carol. Dr. Carol to the Okay. He's a huge ratings getter here at Stand Up. <laughs> huge spikes. The listeners just love when you join me. They must not be aware they can find you on YouTube, their own podcast, the New York Times, and you must not be aware that you don't need to do this. <laughs> no, I love doing this, but I, I think I don't think I think they're not aware of stuff. I agree. That's I don't know. I don't know. Everybody should be subscribing, of course, to Healthcare Triage on YouTube and tell your friends. I mean, when people tell their friends about your YouTube videos, much less your books, I mean, what do you hear? What do you hear from people? The life, it's um, a game changer. I, I mean, I think it's well. I, I mean, the YouTube show is great because I think people can like the stuff lasts forever and people yeah. just it's easy when people ask me questions i can just send them a link it's not that i have to keep repeating myself over and over and they're, they're short enough that it's it's snappy so when you have an answer question four minutes you get an answer great yeah for sure and those things often will allow you to rest your mind in terms of your your salt or your coffee or your kidneys whatever yeah. you're covering you can be like yeah. oh well i you know i always say about you i trust him enough i don't need anybody else uh, whatever he says, I, I can't do the research. He's got the credibility. If he's wrong one in a hundred times, so be it. I'm not going to do any. I'm not looking it up. I don't know how. I appreciate that. But I'd also say like one of the good things about the show is that it's not just like, oh, this is what I think. It's we will describe what research exists and, you know, why it's good or bad. And when we don't know, we'll say we don't know. I trust uh, him good. enough to do the research and I have no ability to do the research. So you have to at some point rely on experts in this yeah. case. There's almost nobody better than you at, at looking at all of the research and then communicating it, which leads me to my uh, next question about science communication. This has been something you've been beating a drum. You've been beating for a long time. And what was it that was the impetus for that tweet uh, the other um. day? I oh it was I it Francis uh was it the uh, former Francis Collins admitting that he thought providing objective data and evidence would be enough to help the public make the right choice about getting vaccinated that could be it that was pretty bad um and I I, I can't remember if it was that or if it was just one of those days where again the CDC was admitting that like yeah I guess we didn't you know we muddled the message and I'm just like you kind of stop muddling the message and getting this wrong and or it might have been the day when it's like I you know, it's like we're telling people if your kid is oh just over five, it's time for them to get a third booster. But if they're four years and eleven months, nothing. Um, right. And it's just like how how do you how do you do that? Like it's just is it some of this communication? Just like what do you you got to like be able to explain this stuff to people, and they're not doing a very good job. Is it you've been explaining it to people for much of your career now, and I wonder is it. It's it's not easy, right? Like could, no. if you were there, if you were at CDC advising, do you think that you're the, because you're so good at it, you would be able to get a message that you think is is the most robust, comprehensive, appropriate, well, understandable? Or is it I hard? Mean, my, ex my experience has been that, first of all, science communication cannot be reduced to a soundbite or a tweet or a TikTok video. Uh, any question that you answer, ask me about covid is going to require me minutes to answer yep. if I'm going to do a decent job. Yep. And so it takes long form podcast or, you know, your radio show back in the day where we would sit and talk about stuff for an hour yeah. uh, to get it done. I do, you know, for most of the pandemic, I would do a weekly webinar for the IU community, the whole hour of answering every single question that I answer them over and over again. I'd answer them and I'd explain the nuance. I have that kind of, and if things changed, I'd explain why they changed. I think when we talk about, how communication gets done sometimes at the CDC level or at a large level, it's they're, they're trying to find, you know, package sound bites that sound perfect. And they're, you know, they really don't want to do long press conferences or, you know, spend time answering every single question because they're worried to get, they're going to get caught in a gotcha question or something like that. I, it can't be done quickly. It can't be done easily. It 
takes detail and you got to do it over and over and over and over again to get correct messages across and across and to build up that kind of, you know, trust. But cable TV is sort of the way news gets out now. You know, it's like prepackaged panels where, you know, everyone, if I, I used to say, if I get called to be in a panel, it'd be four or five people, one person to be a comedian, you know, one person to be a politician, three people be pundits and me. And I'd be the first one that would get booted if there was time. And I would get the question that anyone can answer. They'd be like, so tell us, is it, you know, how hard is it treating patients in the ER? And you go, I imagine it's terrible. And that, like, that's it. Like, that's that's what you brought me here for. Um, but that's that's what cable news is. And unfortunately, that's how most people are getting their news. To be fair, when I was the comedian, I would always consult you before I would give my answers. Which I appreciate. And it's not that I don't think it is. It's just that, like, I no, feel like I, we're, I, I, we need hour-long panels of yep. just science communicators yep. or, you know, experts talking. But that's not what we do. Right. Um, and even when they get a medical expert, nine times out of ten, it's someone treating patients with COVID because they want the dramatic story about its ER doctors. It's, it's critical care doctors. It's infectious disease doctors. It's not... Let's get into the minutiae and the nitty gritty about how, from a public health you know standpoint, we're going to actually be handling this, and it, it, it we just don't do a good job. Uh, let's talk about. I mean, there are a lot of ways to improve that, right? I mean, there are entire. I mean, you, you're you're you've done a tremendous amount of work on trying to help experts be better communicators. Is, is it a is it an issue of funding, resources, changing culture, all the above? Yeah. Uh, I think it's that people think it's easy. I think it's that, uh, you know, people think that, you know, if you can do one thing, you can do anything. Right. Um, and they think that, you know, just because you writ- wrote the important paper or have an important position at a hospital, that, that you're the person that's going to do this. It's a it's a separate skill. Uh, and it took a long, you know, and it takes a long time to hone it. I, I used to joke all the time that, um, you know, when I when I first appeared on your show, what, 2009, 2010, we talked about the Affordable Care Act. And at the beginning, it was it was like panic inducing. But, you know, spend a week, an hour a week answering the public's questions about the Affordable Care Act when people were that angry. And after a while, there was no question left that I hadn't heard before. Right. It, but it took yeah. that kind of grind. It took hours and hours and hours and hours of constantly refining yeah. the answers, listening to people, you know, workshopping how you reply. So you can feel like, OK, now I can actually answer that question in the shortest time possible and try to get the right information. That, I think that, that doesn't, it's not, it's not like this. Like you got to yeah. learn it. Yeah. I think that by the way, answers the first question I asked you about why you're a ratings getter. I mean, that was probably the best work we ever did together is, is giving you that platform and you giving us all that time to answer all of those questions. When people are so confused by a rightfully confusing issue, which is the private health insurance industry, the reforms around it and, 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 and all of the research uh, and so but, people, but that's why when people are like, well, isn't this the worst it's ever been? I'm like, dude, you take questions from the public about the affordable care act during the rise of the tea party summer. Like that was trial by fire. People were angry and screaming yep. and there was so much misinformation. It's like, this is not new. Um, again, it's, it's, it's right. communication one-on-one, but we just, we don't we're not willing to invest the time and the resources and the effort it takes to do it right. We want to find ways to do it easy. The other thing that you've taught us over the years is not only is it hard for experts, scientists, doctors themselves, academics themselves to communicate it. If a study does come out, if research does come out, it's really hard for journalists to translate it. And that's why you're always yeah. in my ear. I'm glad I'm not doing this news segment anymore. But every night when I was doing it on a daily basis, I would see some news, you know, because it's such such clickbait. Uh, new study says coffee blank, wine blank, whatever it is. And I would so badly want to just report that, but I wouldn't because I'd hear you in my voice. But I'm like, is that a good study? And I wouldn't know. And neither does the journalist. So journalists have to do a better job, too. Yes. Well, I think there's there's room to go around all over. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we just did this huge podcast on on research reliability and like a reproducibility and why that's a problem. And it's one of those where everyone is to blame. Uh, you know, the people funding it, the people writing it, the people doing the research, everybody wants a splashy result that's going to get them clicks. Uh, the universities that that house the people want notoriety. They want more grant funding. They want more papers. The journals want this stuff done. The PR departments want this stuff done. And then, of course, the media is also there as well. 
um, in that it is also in their best interest to make it as flashy and newsy and and uh, you know buzzworthy as possible. Good information is sometimes boring. Uh, yeah. You know, if you watch if you watch the weekly webinar that I you know have done for COVID, if you really pay attention, watch every week, I imagine you get bored. A lot of the questions are repetitive. I don't mind it, like because it's new people each week, and sometimes that's what it takes to get the message across. But um, it's a problem. For me, it's your face. <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean, you know, if uh, maybe if you would just wear more costumes on the webinar, maybe, I, you know, some kind no, of. Well, villain. I do. I usually put on like my IU gear. So I'm like, I am wearing like, I mean, usually I'm IU, saying, like uh, a, Get crazy. Get a top hat and a pipe, a monocle, something. <laughs> uh, you do write to the New York I've Times. I wanted to do it while drinking. That would be an exceptional. Oh, episode. yeah. What, have you done anything kind of professional ish while having a drink? Well, like I've done webinars while I've had a drink, like yeah. like afternoon appearance, like or like an evening appearance or something, but yeah. not like drinking. No, no. Oh, well, we should try that or towards the end of your career. Uh, near your latest New York Times piece is titled "Calling in Sick is More Fraught Than Ever." I hope it's getting a lot of attention. It's so so important. You've been, of course, writing about this forever. But before I kind of get into the the, the meat of it. Just the, the final thing you say is this pandemic isn't close to over and it's not the last one we will face going out while you're a, uh, while you're symptomatic, even when you have a negative rabbit test is dangerous to others. Going to work ill isn't a show of strength. It's a sign of a sick system. So well said, but yeah. just the pandemic is isn't close to over. Yeah, I mean, I look one of the, one of the messages I keep beating locally is that, you know, almost every time we find someone with covid, it's like, well, where did you know? well, when did you know you were sick? And they're like, oh, three days ago. You're mm -hmm. like, what What have you been doing? Like, why? Why? Well, and then sometimes if it gets worse, they're like, well, on day one, I took an antigen test and it was negative. And it's like, yeah, but you're still sick. Like, you still have symptoms. I don't want you going out with the flu either. Like, I don't want you giving anybody anything. But a lot of it is COVID. The, the example I use is, you know, we went to a wedding recently and we got home and uh, Amy and, and started to feel sick. And then Sydney did. And like, and I was like, is this COVID? And like tested and it was negative and we tested the next day and it's positive. And that day I was like, well, that's it. You know, I'm going to go down too. So like I worked at home on Friday, this is a Thursday. And over the weekend, I got a really sore throat and I tested and it was negative and I stayed home. And on Monday I tested and it was negative and I stayed home. And on Tuesday it was positive because I knew I was sick. I didn't, you know, I, I, the negative test, I'm living in a house with people with COVID and I got symptoms. I got COVID. Uh, the test is helpful, but it is not the only data point that matters. Right. And we got to do that. Like we've got, I, I really thought, you know, the pandemic touches as anything. It's that, uh, you know, if you are sick, you got to stay home. Don't go out. But part of the problem is that, you know, we might want to say that, but we can't. Um, it is not always possible for people to stay home when they're sick because. Just leave the dog. He'll stay. Like okay, you're getting, yeah, just shut the door. <laughs> is that Noah? Can we? Ed, you can. Ed, yeah, you can edit that or not. But Why I would like, I edit I like, that out? It was good. amazing. I, the fact that he okay. waved was awesome. You didn't. Well, see I was him. like, I was, I was trying to get him to just shut the door because someone's vacuuming back there, and uh, and then like, and then like, I'm like, I don't need you to like appear. I wish you would have screamed. Anyway. I'm on the PBS News Hour. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, you're talking about okay. Yeah, people, people are supposed to stay home, but lots of people can't. Like, you know, first of all, lots of people won't. That's a problem. Like, yeah. you know, we've missed enough proms, weddings, graduations. It's like, I don't care if I got sniffles. I'm going. Well, that's COVID. And that's how COVID gets spread these days. Uh, but more importantly, you know, people don't have paid sick leave or they don't have enough paid sick leave. And if we truly expect that every time someone gets, you know, symptomatic, they're going to stay home. And if they get COVID, they got to stay home for five to 10 days. And maybe also got to take care of a kid who has COVID and you got to stay home and there is no family leave. Uh, that's a broken system. Every, every other United States is the only wealthy country, which has no guaranteed paid sick leave. We're the only one, you know, how generous countries are with their sick leave time by law or by practice is variable, but we're the only one with zero. And even when jobs do offer it, I think like the median number of sick days to a full-time worker in the United States is like seven. A significant number of people have fewer than five. That that won't get you through one case of COVID. All that uh, data is in the in the article. The problem. That, yeah. If people are going to keep getting COVID, and we seem to have removed every other restriction, staying home when you're ill is like the.
bare minimum. Like that's when you're infectious. You know it. You don't want to give it to other people. If people can't stay home, if they're sick, this is over. Like, what are we going to, there's every other metric or every other measure we might take is not going to matter then. And of course, not that maybe those people care, but you, you write about the, obviously the most vulnerable people, those who are the yeah. worst off financially, you write in this article, those who have the greatest difficulty obtaining health care and those who are the most likely to be at risk for COVID complications are often those who lack these benefits. This is especially yeah. true in minority communities, you say. Part time workers, minimum wage workers, they're getting no paid time off, period. Uh, you know, people who are, you know, who rely on public transportation have to take public transportation to get to work. Uh you know, people who are often, you know, with the fewest amount of paid sick days are the people who are at highest risk for bad complications should they get COVID. Uh, and so it's, it, it, you know, it's just one of the other ways that structural racism and disparities are sort of baked into the cake of all of this, that, that the people who, uh, you know, need the most support are the people placed at highest risk and the people who are given as the least amount of benefits often uh, who and and desperately need it. it it's it's just a broken system remember it when really that, that that became controversial that i think it was in new york city or elsewhere they were giving either booster, boosters or vaccines to black and brown folks in certain communities uh and it got twisted by you know people in media and everywhere else that white people are being put you know behind in the most racist way black people are getting the vaccines before white people i think it's right. basically how tucker carlson framed it yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, you can always try to frame it badly, but you know, trying to trying it's an to make public things, make policy. things equitable often means fixing disparities that exist. It's tragic that some people view that as like unfair. Right, right. Uh, the other thing that you write just in in this piece, it's so important to talk about, is that that people with children are especially affected. And I didn't ne- ever know this, but you write young children are sick all the time. Studies show that oh kids. God. Kids can spend more than three months out of their first three years infected and ill. And then, and of course, and babies and small kids are like, that's the beginning. They're always sick. Like, you know, ask any parent. They're like, it feels like especially if you have more than one kid, it feels like someone's always got a cold because yeah. you're transmitting them back. And, you know, kids haven't been exposed to stuff yet. So they get a lot of it. And especially if they're in daycare, they're getting a lot of it really early. And so if you have to treat every infection like it's COVID, like we're asking people to by every guideline and metric. And they're spo- like they can't go to daycare. Then what are parents supposed to do? Um, you know, if you only get a week of paid sick leave a year for you, if you take it for your kid, then what happens if your kid then gives you the like? It's it. This system is broken. It's just not set. Plus, you know, look, we can't keep school age children home every time they get a cold. They get a lot of colds. Like nobody's willing to do that. So given that, well, then fine. Step up the uh, measures in schools. Have phenomenal ventilation. Have test to stay strategies with ubiquitous and often testing with antigen testing. You know, come up with policies where kids who might have colds wear masks or good masks. If you're not going to do it for everyone, at least do it when the risk is there or clearly there. Like if somebody is symptomatic but without COVID, maybe they should wear a mask. Uh, that seems totally reasonable. But we're not, you know, we don't do any of this. You know, all we can do is fight. Yeah, well, I mean, you say that, but there are plenty of states that do do it. The federal government even passed it. I think you mentioned it here. We know that it works here when implemented. Yeah, but we're not doing the big stuff. I mean, really, we're not. There are very few places which are which are truly upgrading their ventilation to where we need it. To be. There are very few places which are you know really investing in new technologies. Very few schools are employing really good test to stay strategies. And these days, to be honest, you know. Schools are either like all in or not at all for masks. Nobody's trying to like thread the needle. Again, I think I got upset with CDC communication because it had to do with planes. So, you know, masks, everybody wears a mask. Then all of a sudden it's like, we don't care anymore. And it's like, everybody's like, well, people weren't wearing masks while they were eating and drinking and they're eating and drinking. And how do you thread that needle? And the CDC was like, and that's like, there's an easy answer. When the ventilation systems are on, planes are incredibly safe. Like they are turning air over really rapidly. You're protected from lots of disease transmission in a plane when the ventilation system is on. When is the ventilation system on? When the plane is taken off until the plane lands, you know, sometimes taxiing. Definitely not when they shut the plane off. So wear a mask until the plane takes off. Then you can take, which is the why they don't care about the eating and drinking, because that's when the ventilation system ah. is going. So why can't we thread the needle? Why can't we say, hey, why don't we wear masks boarding 
until the plane, t- or until we turn the ventilation system on, once it's on, we're, you're all safe. Take it off if you want. Now we're landing. Everybody, please put that for like five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it takes. Or maybe we could just keep the ventilation system on the plane longer. Maybe it'll cost a bit. Maybe we could find ways to subsidize that. But maybe if we kept the ventilation system on all the time, we wouldn't need the plant. We wouldn't need the mat. Like it's like, this is solvable. This is doable, but yeah. it requires nuance. And there's no nuance. It's either everyone put masks on yeah. all the time with loopholes of eating and drinking and everything else, or we give up. Everybody can take off their masks. Uh, sounds like tyranny to me, what you want to do on the plane. Uh, well, uh, sorry about Well, like, again, you could, we could just pay to keep the ventilation system on. And then you really, like, uh, you could do it. We could figure it out. Tyranny Airlines with... Your captain, Aaron Carroll. No, it's yeah. such a, it, it really is. It's so true of your life too. like, no matter who you are, even if you're the craziest anti-mask or whatever, you do all kinds of things nuanced in, in your life. You don't yeah. just, you're not all in on no, seat. Belt. I wear a uh, helmet when I ski. I wear a helmet when I ride a bike. Yeah. That's when I wear a helmet. Like, uh, you know, it's not, and nobody's going to get upset if I take my helmet off while I'm on the chairlift. Like no one's going to parole. Like, it's like, just wear it when you need it. Like, why, why is this so hard? Wear the mask when it's necessary. Don't wear the mask when it's not that helpful. My dad once saw a guy, I'll never forget. I was like 12. He was riding a bike and he had the helmet in his hand. And my dad was outraged. Just, he goes, look at that stupid asshole. Mm. Why would you carry your helmet? The guy might have had a good reason. I don't know, but it did. I seem... can think of a good reason, but um, what, what but, is uh, it? Why but, did he carry his well, helmet? Maybe he was picking someone else and the, someone up, and the, somebody else would wear the helmet. Oh. I don't know. Maybe the helmet broke. Oh, oh, oh! Wow, I didn't. I'm glad I didn't question him. Then he was pretty settled on that conclusion. No, no, uh, no whatever. Let him. Let him live the dream. Hating that... other people is a real pastime in America. <laughs> What do you do, by the way, Aaron, when someone is wildly unreasonable, absolutely nonsensical and stupid and maybe even rude? Um, they're a gate agent. They're a customer service person. They're at, they're at the movie theater. How do you when someone is a real jerk to you? How, what, what happens in your brain? And, I, 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 in my brain, when, I go crazy, but yeah. I disengage. I don't engage. Like I, I've explain long ago that learned. the stimuli occurs and it, you, it is not worth engaging that are like that. It's like, we, you know, I say all the time to you, like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? Yeah. There's no way I'm going to win that argument. There's no way. And nor do I want it. Like I'd, re- I'd rather be, happy. I'm going to walk away. Like I don't mind engaging in, in civil discussion or even talking to people who disagree with me at all. Um, but if you're, if you're just antagonistic and going to cause pain, I'm out, I'm gone. You just, you, you, you leave the, the room. Yeah, I just was like, I'm just going to be like, okay, uh huh, okay, okay, I get it, and then yeah. walk away. I, I hear love, you. That's a good one. I, I hear you. I, the thing that always makes me feel like a little bit small, but also empowered by that is knowing that you're one of the most intelligent people I know, and and reasonable right. and pragmatic, and you could make the most effective argument in a succinct period of time, and you would be right. But yet you still don't do it. And so therein lies the difference between someone like you and me. And you've always counseled me that way. But I still often make the wrong choice. No, there are some times where the only way to win is not to play the game or just to to, to, to not engage in the fight. There are just there's so many times where it's just it is not worth it. You're not going to win because it's like you imagine you're going to win with logic or facts. Like it's some people are not fighting that way. And if they're not, then I I don't want to play. Is there anything before I let you go um, when you see I know I've asked you this question sadly before, but when you see a horrific, you know, violent, especially mass shooting, you've always talked about, you know, looking at gun violence as, as as a whole, like any other issue, because you can't you know, we actually don't have nearly the kind of mass shootings as we do homicides and, and suicides. And so take them each and, and think about policy. But do you when, when you when these last couple of horrific shootings happened, um, when it turns to a question of mental health? Yeah. Um, what, what do you as a policy expert say about that? Because my feeling well, is simply that, yeah, there are a lot of things that would work, but they have to be funded and done. Well, right. no, I, well that's the thing. It's like, you know, most of the people who say, oh, it's mental health are the same people fighting increased funding and resources to take care of mental health. It's like I would truly welcome a discussion of like, how do we improve mental health services for you know, adolescents across the United States? But, you know, no one they're not doing that. Like they're just they're just using it as a scapegoat. Um, that's horrific. Uh, and yeah, yeah, there, I'm sure the Venn diagrams overlap with mental health, but like, unless you're willing to fix that problem, you can't keep blaming it. Then the, the, the same 
politicians who refuse to do anything are the issue. Now, what about a randomized controlled uh, study trial on thoughts and prayers? <laughs> there actually have been a, a couple for like that, but they're, they're minimal effects and they're, they're massively flawed often. So it's just like, in fact, you know what? I almost be like, go ahead. Even though I, I but it, you know, it's, it's clearly not working because, you know, they're trying and there's not even an association between thoughts and prayers getting as good outcomes, let alone causal factors. Uh, last question for you is your second child has graduated from high school is off to college. You've talked openly and honestly about the, the loss that you've suffered with your friend and your parents over the last couple of years. And I know how grateful you are to your own family, your, your wife and kids. What is, what is your feeling? Like, what are your deep feelings when you see your, your son is graduated? He's going to college. Of course, Sydney's still home, but yeah, thank God. But <laughs> yeah, but she's, you, so I don't know. Mostly to be honest with you, like mostly uh gratitude and excitement. Like it's not, I'm not dreading. Like we're feeling like, I mean, I, I feel good about the video. I'm not feeling like we missed something or that something went like the time is gone and we, we blew it. Um, I'm ex- I'm excited for what comes next. I mean, I've been super excited and gratified to watch, you know, Jacob get independent and grow. And I'm excited to do the same for Noah. And, you know, I'm sort of happy that he's not going too far. And I'll, you know, we'll likely get to see him once in a while and that he'll continue to be an active part of our life. I feel great. Love it. I, and I'm sure a lot of people will want to hear that because it is that time of year. Uh, and how many more years till Sydney does she have? Two more. Two more. Yeah. She's going to be rising junior. It's crazy. Yeah. All right, pal. Well, congratulations on that. And thank thank you you very much for joining me. And go read the New York Times piece and subscribe. And I'll say that after I say goodbye to you. So thank you very much, pal. Much appreciated. Anytime. That is Dr. Aaron Carroll, everybody. And I am very happy whenever he joins me. And check him out on Twitter at Aaron E. Carroll. Follow him there. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Get his books, The Bad Food Bible, most recently. And read them at the New York Times and let them know that you heard them here. Never gets old. All right. Dr. Jason Johnson also has an introductory song. And I think I've literally never played it for him. And I'm so embarrassed by that. Uh, And uh, I got to get I got to get that on next time. I apologize to Gareth Sever for not getting it on. Phil Round also wrote a Jason Johnson jingle, but I yet really dropped the ball not getting him on here for Jason to hear next time. Next time. All right, Dr. Jason Johnson, of course. You've seen him on MSNBC. He now anchors there, sitting in for Ari Melber, Joy Reid, and others. He's obviously a contributor there as well. Most importantly, his real job, his big boy job, is the professor of School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University. Also the host of the Slate podcast, A Word with Jason Johnson, on line at jasonjohnson.com, Twitter at DR Jason Johnson and I press record right when he was saying nice things about my involvement in our local BOE campaign against our local anti-diversity anti-CRT people that I opened up to him all about privately a, a couple of times and everything around that so that was very nice here we go yeah yeah yeah, yeah. look at you being like a, a valuable American citizen and getting engaged you you battle against the unending tide of of cynicism <laughs> And apathy yeah. that washes over America on a daily basis. So I'm very proud of you. Uh, very proud. Let's jump off on that point, shall we? Because mm-hmm. I'm I'm wondering uh, what you think is going to make folks come out and vote, uh, specifically black voters. I saw your tweet about, you know, questions for why black voters should vote. What, what have they gotten for their votes for saving basically the country, the state of Georgia, the Senate? Where Where, where, where is the pulse of black voters today, Jason? To, to, to quote the king of the South, T.I., got to bring him out, bring him out, right? So here's the thing. I always find these, these some of these questions about, like, where black folk, they got to come out, whatever. It, it all has to do with, like, the individual places that they're in, right? I mean, I, I am, I, I, I know you're not asking me, but I think it's an important sort of media question. Like, I can't talk for all black people, obviously, right? I can look at data. I can look at statistics. I can talk to folks, you know. Are African-American voters motivated to turn out in Georgia? Well, yeah, because you have competitive and in some case incumbent black candidates at the top of the ticket. And you have a consistent, organized and thorough infrastructure on the ground, knocking on doors, telling people what the heck to do and fighting for their right to vote. 
are black voters as motivated to turn out in Ohio? No, because much as I like Tim Ryan, um, he hasn't necessarily done right. much to galvanize right. African-American voters in Ohio and J.D. Vance could care less. So this idea of like are black people motivated to vote? I think it's kind of weird because you got to look at where people are motivated to vote. And then what does motivation look like? And I'll give you, I'll give a perfect example of this. So you live outside of Syracuse, right? I grew up outside of Syracuse. Now I live just outside of the city, New York. Okay. So just, do you know what the turnout was in the last New York mayoral election? Overall turnout percentage yeah. wise? No, it was like, I think it was under 20%. Wow. The last Atlanta mayor's race, and, you know, Atlanta, and mayor's races in Atlanta are highly competitive. Last mayor's race in Atlanta was 20% turn at 21% turnout. Wow. The turnout for the last mayor's election in Los Angeles was 20%. So I, the reason I always talk about these turnout issues and like when people try and break it down by race, it's like your mayor has so much more of a direct impact on your daily freaking life yeah. than your member of Congress. People don't even turn out for mayor in major cities. In major cities. Everybody wants to talk about, oh, Eric Adams and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, like less than 25% of right. the population of New York City actually voted for this man. Right. Right. You can't even say that you, there's nothing close to a mandate. You won with the 14 to 17% of the people who actually turned out. So I always say, you know, if you're trying to get people motivated and out to vote, you got to have you got to have a story. You got to engage them you have to give them candidates at the top of ticket they care about because these major cities where the mayors actually make a damn difference one way or another um oftentimes people don't even show right they don't even show so. if you don't show up do you still get to complain uh yeah that's my right as an american <laughs> i get to i get to complain about food that i don't produce i get to complain about <laughs> service that i don't understand i get to yell about hollywood movies when i know nothing about the process and i get to bitch and moan excessively about how Congress operates, despite the fact that I cannot name my member of Congress. These are the rights of your average American citizen. I get to complain about gun laws and continue to vote for Republicans. I get to continue to, to complain about abortion rights and LGBTQ issues, but I don't have any sort of religious backing or understanding one way or another. I, you know, I, I probably could qualify. If it weren't for the fact that I know how this system works so well, I would probably be the kind of person who is so informed about politics that I'm absolutely cynical as to participate. <laughs> I, I would be because I would yeah. look at this stuff as like not a darn thing that I'm actually asking for is actually getting done one way or another. Right. But, right. Hey. Well, not how the world necessarily always works. So it's supposed to, though. I should feel entitled and get what I want. That's how it <laughs> <this> works. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a nice world to live in, even in your own house? Yeah, I haven't. Yes. I haven't talked to you since we talked two days before the Buffalo shooting, and then I awkwardly like had to play our interview after it, and certainly preface it with Jason and I talked just before the horror in Buffalo, which of course was uh, the racist shooting, and then before those bodies were buried, there was a horrific shooting of twenty children in, in Texas. And I, my question to you is, you know, what, what, what if anything changes after these shootings? You've been tweeting a lot about the police reaction, a lot of people talking about that, but. In terms of these types of horrible mass shootings, I, I always want to give credit to the local and state laws, speaking of which, that have changed. And there's yeah. been a lot of movement on that. I worry about what the Supreme Court eventually does with those laws. But what, if anything, do you think this changes? They're already start talking about some reasonable Republicans that might pass something. Yeah. So the, the, the two biggest things that I take away uh, from from both of these things, um, you, we I don't know the numbers for Buffalo. I think I know the numbers for Uvalde. It's uh, it's 19 kids, 19 kids. And I think two teachers like um, it's like 17 kids and two teachers or whatever it is who were shot. But I think the other thing to remember, which is seldom reported and a, a great colleague, great reporter, Wesley Lowry pointed this yeah. out to me. Is he's like a lot of times in these mass shooting incidents, there's no reporting about shooting victims. They only report on the people who've been killed. 38 people got shot. In Texas? I mean, like, yeah, it was like 38 people. Oh, if wow. I remember it correctly, 38 people actually got shot. Now, 19 died. But like the you, there are people living with gunshot wounds now, you know, people who will need years of physical therapy and psychological therapy and stuff like that. Like well, anybody like that was in those buildings that day is yeah. wounded. And you've seen all these reporting uh, like all the hundreds of thousands of people have been victims. But if they were just in the building, you. you yes. Yeah. You're not OK. Right. You're not OK. <laughs> never, maybe I mean, never. Like, 
you, you know, there, there's, you know, there's gotta be somebody in there. And I mean, in every single one of these places, you know, what do you do with someone who's like, I, yeah, I'd like to go back to work, but like, I have a freaking panic attack every right. time I pull into the parking lot. Right. I can't work indoors anymore. Right. I, you know, I, I got to go to a therapist. And I mean, like those, that's not crazy. That's not, you know, I mean, you have people who have those kinds of responses. You can have people have those kinds of responses in general. Oh, I, so have, I mean, one, I had minor responses of, of, of that in uh, New York City after 9-11 going up in buildings, elevators. All bingo. That. Yep. It, yep. Per, exactly. Sure. Exactly. You know, somebody who's like, look, I can't get in elevators. I'm freaked the hell out. Yeah. Like, that's a real normal response. As a result response. of a thing they experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's one thing. I mean, it's always sort of bigger and, 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 and worse. That's and a great point. And particularly, we can look at that with Buffalo. But then the other part of it, and I think this applies to Buffalo, applies to Uvalde. It's what I've been tweeting. And I want to make sure this is very clear. I'm making a generalized statement about this, and I'm contextualizing it with all sorts of other public servants, uh, school teachers, EMTs, uh, you know, trash collectors, everything else like that. Cops lie all the damn time. They do. And it is important that journalists treat police officers with the same level of skepticism that they treat politicians. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we've heard half a dozen lies that have been clearly debunked by the Uvalde Police Department. It's crazy. Just crazy. I mean, like, like, like just really obvious stuff. Like, oh, the guy had body armor. Wait, he didn't have body armor. Well, the guy, you know, kicked in the door, waving a 4-4 and shot 12 people. Actually, he didn't. Well, there weren't any other people there, but then we took some parents. Lying, 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 lying. These aren't mistakes. These aren't accidents. These people are lying. And again, if they're willing to lie about something that's got global intergalactic scrutiny on yeah. it, how much you think they lie about what happened to your 17-year-old who came home with a black eye and they say, oh, you know, we saw him on the side of the street drunk. Right. You don't know what they did. Do we really know that the that the, the the shooter in Buffalo had body armor and they shot him five times? It just didn't work. You know how hard it is to shoot somebody five times and not hit something that's protected by body armor? It's extremely difficult. Those Buffalo cops aren't sharpshooters. Do you know what it would feel like? I don't know, Pete, if you've ever had on body armor. I was just with a good friend of mine. I played I was down paintball in once uh, shirtless. Because you're you were trying for jackass. I, like, I was with a, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that? trying to impress young people. Yeah. Mm, it hey kids, that's a very miserably. Steve Buscemi Steve Buscemi uh, yep. <laughs> meme there. Yep. Um, but yeah, like like I've had on body armor. I see what body armor looks like. A friend of mine was showing me new body armor. He just body armor he just bought down in Georgia. Why did you your know, friend buy body armor? Because he's a fifty year old black man and he lives in Georgia and he feels in danger all the time. Really. You know, people almost, like, almost all my black male friends own guns, all of them really? in different parts of the country. Yes, because they 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 fear being victims of white vigilante violence. Yeah, I mean, I'll I, I'm thinking about it and I'll say I think most of mine do, too. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I don't tell people uh, I don't tell people whether I have a gun or not. I say they don't want to find out. Um, that's but good. that's good. That's what I say. If people ask me if, I've, if I have a crossbow, which only has been asked of me once, but go ahead. I mean, you know, if you pick one up from the Norman Reedus, uh, walking dead collection, <laughs> it's not so bad to be on display. So I interrupted uh, you. I interrupted you when I, when you, when I said, why does your friend have body armor? So you were, you were saying that he, yeah, he, he was, he was saying it's for safety. Yeah. He doesn't always feel safe. Jesus. Um, and, and, and he, and I could relate this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'll send this to him, but you know, he's from California and we were out, we were out um, watching the game, getting wings. And he was showing me pictures of his new body armor. Send me the link on how to get some. I was like, dude, like you're getting body armor. He's like, yo, he's like, I moved out here. And the way these people sort of operate in the South. And it was very interesting as he was telling me how, you know, moving from California where guns are like, Ooh, I mean, he's from Northern California. He's like, guns are bad and terrible. He's like, but you get down here you're like, what the hell? Like, (laughs) you know, it's duck down Avenue around here. And these are, I think what's interesting is when I think of him, and a lot of other of my you know black male friends, it's not crime. They're not buying guns because they fear someone robbing their homes or harming their children and partners. It is literally they fear white violence. They fear white people showing up and threatening them. They fear white people um, just trying to harass them in their homes and their communities. Like mm-hmm. this is a fairly consistent thing. And so you know I- I'm. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised when I see 
mass shootings and acts of violence like what we saw in Buffalo and everything else like that. But I do think that the the amount of sort of consistent fear and anger that black folks live under because they figure that white people are going to go around continuing to shoot. No one's going to be held accountable. There won't be any substantive changes in laws. No one's going to scream and cry one way or another. I mean, even the conspiratorial things associated with the Buffalo shooting are, are, are looking even weirder and weirder. If you go down um, some pathways in the black internet world, mm. um, most folks don't feel safe. I mean, you really, really don't feel safe and don't feel safe. I mean, think about it. Think about it, Pete. If I were, if I were in, in, in an instance of a mass shooting and I can't imagine what that's like, right? I'm speaking about this very generically, right? I don't know what that would be like. I don't know how to respond, whatever it is, but I can imagine a circumstance where if I call the police, I would fear that they'd shoot me when they arrived. Yeah. I mean, it's happened. It yeah. has happened. You know, you you've had instances where black people call about the commission of a crime and the police will arrive and arrest the black person. Yeah. I mean, it happens all them. the time. Whether yeah. or not they get shot, they get they could get arrested or roughed up. I mean, that that's another thing we don't keep track of. We yeah. always talk about death and, you know, we don't talk about abuse. Yeah, it's just a harass. Yeah. Yeah. The and, and, and we always talk, we always talk about uh, minorities. And I always want to be like, hi, they, they're not <laughs> that nice to us either. Just to be I mean, nah. I'm not not comparing, but I'm just saying, like, we should we should count all of the abuse. It's not just. You know, it's it's a systemic. It's the system. It's the badge and the gun and the attitude and everything else. Well, and, and you know, I've, I've used this example for years. I mean, you you look at the layers upon layers of just incompetence and cowardice um, that we saw um, with so many different police officers in Uvalde. Yeah. Where, I mean, literally for them to make the argument, hey, they didn't want to go in um, because they might get shot. I saw that. And I was like, dude, really? Really? You think? You think? But this is the thing. That's the same argument. The danger of the job is the same argument that police use all the time to justify the violence that they inflict upon black and brown people. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's a dangerous job out there. That's why I had to club this kid. Hey, it's a dangerous job out there. That's why I had to take Freddie Gray on a rough ride. Hey, it's a dangerous job out there. That's why I had to drag that woman out of her house naked and, and, and frisk her in broad daylight only to realize we we're at the wrong house. So, you know, you use the violence and the danger of the job, even though I don't know, being a roofer technically <laughs> is a more dangerous job than being a cop. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of thing. It, it, it's all it's all absolute nonsense. And if you had more anger and, and, and less tolerance for dishonesty and, and lack of ethics on the part of police departments, um, all these guys would be fired. And I'll, and I'll say this because it's important for context. You know, the, the, the police officer, the resource officer in Parkland who was supposed to protect the kids and then he he ran away? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, that guy got his job back. What? Yeah, quiet is kept. He the union fought for him and he got his job back and he got backpack. I think he's running said, away I said, when the Parkland shooter came. I thought he said and he got backpack. I'm like, they gave him a backpack? <laughs> they gave him one of those those nice ones that kind of look like Yoshi from Mario Dora? Brothers backpacks. It was amazing. This is a Russell Westbrook collection. Yeah, I mean like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wow wow uh, you you are going in on these cops i haven't paid close enough attention i know there's going to be a, a, a federal investigation but from oh, what like i that'll do anything for, yeah <laughs> that's right but from what i have seen they are uh negligent if not responsible for for maybe uh children dying is that is that too far to go no I mean, do it's we not know? it's 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 not because look they just had an active shooter training in the city schools two months prior to this. They literally had just gone through active shooter training in the schools. So it's not like, oh, we forgot what we were supposed to do. All of the documentation, all of the rules in their own police handbooks are like, you're supposed to go in. You're supposed to go in. It's about saving lives. You're supposed to go in. And they didn't do it. And they're going to try and blame 12 different people. Well, remember, first, they tried to make themselves look like heroes. Yeah. They tried to make it like they were the freaking oh, yeah. expendables and they had some shootout with the guy that turned out to not be true. I don't know how. I mean, I'm still uh, mm. I, I still have serious questions as to how an 18 year old who had a minimum wage job with Texas minimum wages was able to get himself three thousand dollars worth of, of guns and equipment. Right. 
I couldn't save three thousand. I mean, that you know how much, how long it takes you to save three thousand dollars? Yeah, I mean, how come that's so hard to figure out? Like, we'll find that out. How he got his gun, right? Well, we'll know every nook and cranny of this kid's life soon enough, won't we? People are digging. Well, in. we should by now. But the the Buffalo shooter is the same situation. Parents went and bought this kid, you know, and and now you have again uh, actual reporting from New York Times, Washington Post that yeah. he may have been commiserating with a retired federal agent. When he was putting together his white nationalist manifestos, commiserating meaning plotting with, or the guy was an undercover. There was a report. Uh, no, 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 no. So this guy was not undercover. There's a report that one of the people who he was talking about uh, talking with and may or may not have been sharing his manifesto with. Um, it was a retired federal agent. Great. Who That's was not great. doing an investigation. Just something. But, but look, I've been like, like we needed to know this ever since January 6th, what do you say, right. 20% of the people who participated are former law enforcement? That's crazy. That's a crazy statistic. I mean, I it's mean, not, it's, it's it's not I know it's not, but it still is. I, it's harder, it's hard for some people to believe. It shouldn't be, I realize, because of, but this you know, is, history. I'd but. Say, but this is the big thing, Pete. This is like, I think that this is the big overall part that I think is just like, is, is why why so many people feel the way that they do. Even you saying like, Hey, they're not great to me, blah, blah, blah. It's because, and and, and I, I can say all this with absolute comfort. When I said it two years ago, people were like, Oh, I don't really know. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This is why I am a police abolitionist. This is why I think yeah. that we need to abolish policing the way it currently works. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. How many more of these situations do we have to see right. where we find out the cops are running drugs? We find out the cops are not doing their jobs, abusing and beating people. And I know that's not the majority of police officers. But you know what? I've always said if the percentage of school teachers yeah. <laughs> were, as, you know, if, if school teachers were doing as bad a job as cops, we'd fire all the teachers. Or any other, or any other public worker, for that matter. It's you know, dude. Can, can you can you imagine uh, the the head of a, a county or a city emergency room holding a press conference and just lying, and we find out twenty four hours later. Yes, we had uh, twelve people who were shot this weekend. Uh, all twelve survived. In fact, they're upstairs playing basketball right now. They're great. And then the next day, it's like they're all dead. What, <laughs> did you, did you lie? <laughs> and like, oh well, we had to investigate. How, how did you have to investigate? You said they were upstairs playing basketball on the second floor of the damn. Hospital. No, the guy who was in charge of the second floor uh, <laughs> was out that day, and right. I ended up talking to the third floor guy, and everybody on that floor was all right. So sorry about that. They're all dead. Everybody died. right, right, exactly. We'll let you know if their condition changes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like, what the hell? Uh, Okay, so I'm seeing. Uh, let's just do the politics of it, the politics mm -hmm. of, of of gun, and I'll let you go. But uh, Pam Keith tweeting: one of the Republicans' favorite tricks is to give Democrats hope of finding a bipartisan solution to something, then go, then dither and make demands that water down the solution to nothing, and then walk away in a huff, insisting Democrats made an agreement impossible. They will do this on guns. Do you think this time is different? No, and I, I look. I've 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 been on the air with Pam Keith. I mean, I think she's a, a dedicated, uh, you know, public servant. So, you know, I, I want to say that first. I just completely disavow that entire narrative. I think it's it, it's pointless. Good. Why do we keep having these discussions where it's like, well, the Republicans who 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 cares? Who cares? We know what the Republican organization is going to do. So why even discuss them in the context of these policies? You know what they're going to do. You know what they're going to say. You either make the changes or you don't. Right. You, 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 you operate. You maximize the power that you have as president of the United States. We don't see that kind of energy from Joe Biden. Now, look, there's certain things he can and cannot do. Right. Like, let's be fair. He, the, you know, the president in terms of executive orders. Yeah. There's but so much he can do as far as as far as as guns. But the consequences he can put together sort of stricter consequences for these sorts of things, push more for his party, but he can't wave a magic wand and end gun violence in America. So I, I think, but I think the idea of having these discussions, I'm not the only person who said this. Everybody has said this once Sandy Hook happened. And we saw that, that, you know, upper middle-class white children could be slaughtered and the Republican party didn't blink. I mean, that was kind of the end of the gun debate in America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I think it's a really, very good point. Uh, and also, Jeff Jarvis said the thing about Republicans tackling mental health is that seriously, the place to start is with their own delusional behavior. You think of that? Uh, I, I love Jeff. I, I would also add, 
I think mental health is a red herring because a lot, look, a lot of the people who are committing these mass shootings, right? We see who they are. Uh-huh. They are young men. Strangely, they're almost never African-American, but we could talk about why that case. Um, but they tend to be young white men, occasionally young Asian men, occasionally young Latino men. But I don't I mean, like the way we, you did that white person impression, by the way. Oh, no, that wasn't a white person impression. I was just being very quiet. We were quiet about it. I mean, uh, I look white of, to me. <laughs> I, I think there have been like three African American mass shooters I can think of in the last twenty five years. Right, there was John Lee Malvo and his son. Uh, the the I mean that was that crazy uh, gateway you know shooter back in uh, like two thousand two. Uh, you had the guy in Dallas, Texas, and you had the guy in L A. And in both of those instances, those guys were targeting cops. Yeah, I I I, I have said this before. It's really offensive. It's politically incorrect. It's not true, but I've said it, so I'll say it again because it's kind of true. Black people are angry, thus the violence. White people tend to be real crazy, thus the violence. And there's kind of a different a way to, I think, policy-wise, deal with both situations, by the way. Well, but, yeah, you know, the common yeah. thread, of course, is men and guns. But Yeah, exactly, exactly. That, that's, yeah, that's a common thread that sort of run throughout all of it. Yeah. But I think in a lot of the, the, the problem with mental health is that a lot of these people who who commit these horrible mass shootings they wouldn't be picked up by anybody, right? Like you could have maybe with this, with this, the young man who was down in Texas, maybe he could have been kept from buying a gun if he had been flagged, right? It's like, hey, you've made online threats. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this. We've seen but your I mean, creative writing. Right, exactly. You've threatened people online. Okay, fine. You're not going to be allowed to buy a gun. But like the mental health thing doesn't work because some of these people have no criminal record. Right. They have no prior criminal record. They have nothing. That, and, and I'm sorry, you're trying to tell me that, like, if you if you go get help because you're clinically depressed, that you can't buy a gun. I mean, I, I, well, I don't know that I think that makes any sense. Yeah. What if you're depressed because you're a victim of domestic violence and you bought a gun to feel safe? Right, right, right. All, all good points. I mean, obviously, you still invest in mental health, but this is more about connecting somehow someone's mental health with their propensity to violence towards others or themselves and trying yeah. to flag that, which there are plenty of ways to do that. And it works when it's certainly when it's the law, it, it, it right. can work. Uh, before I let you go, I, help me with something. I suspend <laughs> all of my kind of judgment and, 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 and ethnic, my morality when it comes to Tom Cruise, I don't care what he does <laughs> to other people. I don't care how he behaves on set. I don't care if he's a Scientologist. I don't care how he is with his kids, his wives. He is the last bona fide, not the last, one of the last movie stars. And I'm gonna, you don't, you don't think so. And I'm going to uh, allow, I'm going to watch his movies and I'm going to like, so them this lot. is the thing I, I, I had um, Kelly Carter who, if you don't follow her or whatever is, arguably one of the best smartest entertainment journalists in this country. Okay. Um, Kelly Carter, who writes for the undefeated and has her own podcast, just really, really, really brilliant. And I'm, I'm saying this contextually for a reason. She's one of the only people who's ever explained to me what an A-lister actually is. Like uh-huh. there's an actual, there's a numerical rubric for what makes you an A-list. Oh yeah. I didn't know. Like she's like super duper. She's like in Mensa. Like she's that smart hmm. anyway. So I say this because, having had conversations with her years ago about what actually makes stars and everything else like that, this idea that Tom Cruise is the last movie star. It's just this sort of weird hagraphy nostalgia about what, what I mean, well, what the hell is a star, right? Like to, to me, the rock is a movie star. The rock literally does everything. Yeah. The rock does commercials and sells food products all over the world. And I mean, so I, I don't see Tom Cruise as being the last movie star when you literally have Dwayne Johnson making billion dollar films every couple of years. Okay. Now that's well stated. I should have never said the last movie star get to the point about me being okay with him and wanting to see him. I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I also want to add for context. Did you, you know, know, I think you'll like where this is going. I also want to add for context. I mean, take your time. I just don't want you to At, at, at any one time, at any one time in popular culture, you know, we're, let's see, you know, 2012, 2002, uh, you know, 1992, whatever it is, we generally only have one to three big movie stars anywhere. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, we had our Sylvester Stallone 
and Arnold Schwarzenegger era. And it was pretty much just those two. We had our Will Smith action star. Era. There's usually only one or two big deal. Oh, I, 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 I even I can can defeat that silly argument. <laughs> why but do you I, why do you hate Clint Eastwood? Um, because and, I didn't go back that far. And I didn't uh, go back to the 70s. He Den, wasn't like Denzel he was, Washington is a, uh, Ethan Hawke. <laughs> oh, you know what? Stop it. Stop it. And, and, and I did not like him in Moon Knight. Um, oh, because wow. Moonlight was kind of disorganized. Oh, wow. But, but, but I say all this to say, Ethan Hawke. I saw Top Gun Maverick last Thursday. Oh, wow. Oh, don't. No, hey, easy. Watch yourself. I'm, I'm about I'm about this. I'm going in. Calm, I'm going in. I'm calm. going in. It is one of the best damn movies I've, I've heard. seen in a decade. I've heard. It is incredible. Oh, I can't wait. It's really, really. I don't care what he does, to anybody. It, it's it's crazy <laughs> how much fun that movie. I will is. never think about while watching this new movie that he does not talk to his child. I won't think about it. I, you know what? I look. If I <laughs> cared about the politics and the ideology right. of most people who entertain me, I wouldn't watch sports. I wouldn't. I wouldn't right. do any of this stuff. Right. Right. I couldn't. Right. right. And, you know, and, you know, I'm pretty ideologically driven, but I will tell you, you know, I didn't, I, you know, the first Top Gun, I can barely remember. I was a kid when it came out as, you know, a bunch of 80s nostalgia, snosh, whatever. But this one is, it's just a good movie. And and it, the cinematography, like, go find the clip with James Corden where he goes on flights. With I Tom did Cruise. see that. I watched it. Oh, my That's gosh. That's how much of a fan I am. The, the ringer.com has a great story. You don't want to read it now because you want to see the movie first where they interview. Um, they do sort of an oral history of all the young pilots that, that they put together for the movie. Oh my gosh. I, I have, I, it, there are very few movies I've been in where were I was like, pilots I would before love for this. their actors in this movie. Well, no, 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 no. So oh. some of them had pilot training, but they had to train them. all. Oh, got it. Yeah. And they talk about the insane stuff that they did and the stuff that Tom Cruise taught them how to do what 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 really struck me about the ringer article and again this doesn't spoil anything about the film but i was really impressed and i'm like you i'm like eh there's weird stuff about tom cruise from time to time but what really yeah. struck me about the article is the investment that he seemed to make in the young actors that were his co-stars mm. like they were like this guy has really like invested in us and told us like I picked you guys because I think you're all about to be sort of the next generation of great stars. So I'm going to give you all this insight, all this training, all this stuff about how to put together movies. Like they were like the guy taught us stuff right. throughout the entire yeah. process. It's really impressive. And you will say, wow, multiple times in this film. None of this is CGI. I, I didn't know planes could do some of the stuff they showed in the movie. I can't wait to see it. That is quite a review. And it also yeah. explains why, as I'm looking at you in your in your place, you have cardboard cutouts of John Voight and Kevin Spacey because yeah. you're just a fan of their work. You 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 can't yeah, yeah, you yeah. suspend I, your you know judgment. Their their obscene politics and penchant for you know abusing people, getting caught for abusing Is people that a Jimmy over and Woods over and over again. A poster behind you. <laughs> Look, is that can't Kevin? We separate the art from the artist, Pete. Can't we do that? Do yeah, we have I to mean, be so judgmental. But Kevin Sorbo was never a good artist. I don't know why you need that action figure. Uh, dude, I never even watched Hercules. So uh, I don't understand. Like, I mean, there's people who've got nostalgia for this dude, but I'm like, dude, I didn't watch you then. Uh, the, I don't know why anyone gets mad at your tweets now. You ran around with with a fake Mac uh, Ricardo Montalban, you know, chest plate. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I mean, I know more people that are nostalgic about Xena than. Yeah, than yeah. Well, about she's she's the she lives on Earth one, which is funny. Um, OK, just <laughs> last last quick question. You see Kirk Cameron's name trending on Twitter today. Yes. Do you click to see why? Yes or no? Uh, I think he has a new reality TV show about families or something like that. Yeah, he is starring um, an upcoming uh, film, The Homeschool Awakening. Yeah. Yeah. I, this, I'm glad I just plugged it. This is one thing about Kirk Cameron that Go ahead. I will I will say. Okay. And I think it's very it's interesting for people to forget about. It. So do you watch yeah, Pete, you watch Stranger Things? Oh no, but I saw you've been you just started watching yeah, that. No, love I it. absolutely I just, love it. I just, no, just watch the the first part of the final season. Am I the only one left? You are. It's good it's good TV. All right. It's got its problems, as it all does, but it's good TV. <laughs> so Stranger Things this last season takes place in nineteen eighty six. And I'm not spoiling anything, but it's really well done how they capture 
some of the religiosity and the conservative stuff that was popping up in the 80s. Like people, you know, they think of, you know, risky business and, 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 and you know, Red Dawn and stuff like that. And they forget about like Tipper Gore was having congressional hearings to try to shut down D. Snyder and, and, and rock bands. You forget that they were like national protests, people saying that the Smurfs was going to turn us all into Satan worshiping maniacs, <laughs> right? Like that stuff was happening in the yeah. 80s. And, and, and there, was a, there was a real underlying streak of conservatism and religiosity. So I say that to say Kirk Cameron going from teen heartthrob to conservative activist for at this point almost 30 years. Yeah. I don't have to agree with his politics or his interpretation of faith, but the dude's been consistent. I mean, like he, he left growing pains because he thought growing pains was too risque. Yeah. And he didn't like having a co-star who would once appeared in playboy. And um, his uh, best and, friend's name, uh, character's name was boner. I think that was probably, uh, yeah, yes. He had no problem with a, he had no problem with seven <laughs> seasons of a best friend named boner, <laughs> but a young lady who had appeared in playboy topless ones was too much for him. I didn't know but, that. That oh yeah, yeah. That oh, was that was one of the reasons that he left. Ooh. But here's the thing: do you you remember Left Behind? You remember the Left Behind series? Uh, yeah, that was like a Christian. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was late '90s. Another it was this p- idea that the rapture had occurred, yep. and you had this collection of white suburban conservatives who were left behind because they didn't love Jesus in the proper kind of white? way, and like 99%. I read some of the left behind books. They were almost all white and the movies that they made <laughs> were like 99% white. And Kirk Cameron was a part of those. Movies. Yeah. Yeah. That was his thing. He was selling them at night. I remember almost like time life books. It's yeah. like, come watch the left behind series. You anyway, read them. It, um, yeah, I think I've read like two, two left behind books. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. you got left behind. I was curious. I didn't want to be left behind. I didn't want to have Jesus FOMO. If I knew, I if, want- if I knew you were reading them, I would have definitely left you behind. <laughs> I, I they they were worth understanding for the time. It's like reading. Well, books I wasn't by expecting Elon you to go on this magnanimous rant. I was, you know, I knew you had to go, and I was like, yes or no. You click on it, and you really had a lot of thoughtful things to say about Kirk Cameron being true to himself and consistent. I'm really disappointing, to be honest. I with know. You. I, I, I <laughs> because for me, for me, I would rather you be true to yourself yeah. on some stuff that I don't agree with. Sure, no, Look, I, go I, make agreed. your money. Like I. The, the, the thing that doesn't bother me, and this goes back to sort of what we we're saying about Tom Cruise, the thing that doesn't really bother me about Kirk Cameron is he said, I have this set of values. I no longer want to do mainstream Hollywood and yep. has spent 30 years producing content for other people who think like him. Yep. Dude, fine. Yep. I have problems with people who try to mess up the stuff that I enjoy. Right, right. If no. you don't like what I like on TV, go find your own stuff. <laughs> Very <laughs> mature, intelligent, thoughtful take. I wouldn't expect anything less from the likes of you. But tried to bring you <laughs> well, down do. to my level. You weren't having it. And now I look terrible. Uh, well, you know what, Pete? That's what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> you should understand. That's what happens in politics now. Yeah, you know, yeah. you go low and I go high. Yeah. So yeah. Now- <laughs> I saw. Thank you very much for joining me as always. I really appreciate it. That was awesome. Thanks, man. Later. All right. There goes Jason Johnson. And please let him know you heard him here on the show. Dr. Jason Johnson on Twitter. Aaron Carroll as well. And speaking of which, Aaron shared this tweet yesterday that that, uh, someone put out. This is a young group of African girls and they are performing Vivaldi at Education Africa's International Marimba and Steel Pan Festival. I sometimes replace John Carroll, the great John Carroll, every once in a while with, with something different. And this is the Gode Hoop Marimba. Uh, and I just absolutely love this. It put me in such a good mood. You got to watch the video, though. It's on YouTube. And I'll, I'll link to it, but search Godi Hoop Marimba performing Vivaldi at Education Africa's International Marimba and Steel Pan Festival. That's what this is. I'm going to shut up and let you hear it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Be the change you want to see in the world. I love you. Bye-bye.